Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Pierce Miller, a passionate educator and entrepreneur who is a master at developing successful academic program models. As a career college professional, he has helped shape the academic policy for several schools, improving retention and overall student performance. Pierce has taught at the Pennsylvania Institute of Culinary Arts and served as the president of the Pennsylvania Culinary Institute Le Cordon Bleu program, as well as vice president of academics for Le Cordon Bleu, where he developed curriculum and worked closely with our good friend and an Ultimate Dish podcast favorite, Chef Edward Leonard. Join me today as I chat with Pierce about his role in culinary education, creating effective academic business models, and his love for hockey. And there he is, Dr. Pierce. How are you, buddy? All right. I'm doing great here, Bachman. How are you? <laughs> oh, my gosh. How long has it been? It's been way too long. You look so good. How's well, life in the bird? I'm myself after, after you and, and Chef Ed Leonard. You know, I, I'm not <laughs> sure I can keep up. Oh, well, you better try harder. But I do like what you, what, what, what you have on your head there, buddy. We're going to oh, talk yeah, about the pens a little bit today. That's it. That's the ultimate. Nice hat. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today, buddy. How how is pseudo retired life in the Berg? Oh, uh, retired life is great. It's uh, lots of golf. Of course, you <laughs> got to throw some hockey games in there, and a little little bit of, as you know, we say in the Berg, Stiller football. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, I have the uh, ultimate honeydew list. You know, as uh, the free time becomes greater, the list gets longer. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, you mentioned you know football. I as a as a lifelong sports fan, and 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 I'm I'm going back several years here. I could remember the first time, you know, I came to visit you and and the folks at the school, and I came through the tunnel, and I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Coming through the tunnel to originally see the infamous Heinz Field, I think Three River Stadium, right, and which I think now are called, you know, PNC Park, and um, I'm not sure what the football field is called anymore, and then the rivers, right. The way the city just sits there, let me see if I, the Allegheny, the Ohio River, of course, and then uh, the the Monongahela, did I get that right? Monongahela. Monongahela, there you go. But what a view when you come through that tunnel and you see all that, right? Mm -hmm. And little known useless fact, I was at PNC Park when it was probably supposed to be at the school on the fourth day that it was ever open watching the pirates play that's that whole area has really built up hasn't it absolutely uh i you you mentioned three river stadium three river stadium was actually in between pnc park and now uh used to be heinz field is now acrisure stadium acrisure there you go there you go Acrisure, you know for the insurance company i believe out of michigan if i'm not mistaken but anyway heinz uh three river stadium was right in between those two so they took that area and expanded it out and we also have Rivers Casino now down to the uh, to the left of of Acrisure Stadium. So we got the conglomerate all right there. So all that's been wow. built out. Lots of restaurants and 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 people coming over the f the footbridge and attending yeah. the games and such. Uh, yeah, I just I absolutely love that. Pittsburgh was always kind of interesting. Like so, you know, I lived in Chicago, and you know, tons of people live in the city. Same in Portland, Oregon. When I lived there, people live in the city. But Pittsburgh's a little different, right? Five o'clock, six o'clock, boom, that city empties out, doesn't it? <laughs> it's at seven o'clock and you won't find anybody. Yeah. Yeah. They all head to the burbs to uh, you know, to get home. Say, so, hey, let's let's talk education right away. First and foremost, we we got a little get a little background. I may not know this. Are you originally from from Pennsylvania? Yes, Pittsburgh, born and bred all my life. Your whole life, right? Never moved away never moved. Wow. Wow. Rare, rare these days. So let's, let's talk education right off the bat. I know how important education is to you always has been. And, you know, some of my fondest memories of Pierce of your style of, let's say, impacting students included, I'm not going to ask you to sing today, but playing the guitar just, and, 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 and I'll let you speak to it. Like, 
you, you know, how did that work? Was what was the guitar kind of to draw people in, take the focus off of what you were saying and just kind of make make your students part of the conversation? You you were a facilitator of knowledge long before we wanted teachers to be facilitators of knowledge. Right. What, right. what where does all that stem from? And, and, and are you still playing the guitar when you're when you're teaching? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, Kirk, I think it encompasses a number of different things. One is I started bringing it out because I think it was a way to just connect directly with students. Yeah. You know, yeah. what student these days doesn't love music in some way, shape or form. And there's so many different styles of music. Uh, more importantly, I wanted the students to see me as, you know, just another person, not necessarily, uh, you know, the teacher, the instructor, the head of the class or you know, later on, as I became president of the, of the Culinary Institute, you know, they, they viewed me as a president and it was something that was a little scary. So that just bridged the gap. And a lot of times students can re relate directly to that. And I used to tell students, you know, you never know what somebody knows until you really get down and spend some time with those individuals. And I think that's really critical, not only from students to the instructor or to me at that time, but from myself to the students, because a lot of times I found out we had some very talented students that wrote music, sang, you know, danced, whatever they did. They had a lot of talent outside of just trying to become a culinarian and graduate from school. And we lost sight of that. So I think that's critical as an instructor, as a really uh, student centered educator to know what your students are, know where they're going from. And sometimes just let your hair down and know, you know what? They could see that I could play, really couldn't sing too well, but that's okay. <laughs> well, and your teachers, you, you have to talk about that as well. And you, you know, you were intentional about your level of comfort in front of the classroom. And when your teachers see that, then they start to realize too, wow, you know, I, I, I can, I can change it up a little bit in the classroom as well. Right. right. Yeah. And everybody's got a different learning style. Um, is is what I've learned over the years. There's not just one way to get across. And this idea of just facilitating knowledge, putting knowledge out there and then letting people absorb it and interpret it in their own special ways is probably the right way, right way to go. And I'm I'm suggesting that you were doing that before I even thought about it. Because I I've seen you with the guitar in front of the classroom. I'm thinking, what is he doing? <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, you have different styles of learners, Kirk, and you know this, you know, you have auditory learners, they, they need to hear it, and you have visual learners that they need to see it, and then you have kinesthetic learners, they need to touch it, yeah. and actually do it, you know, and that's where a lot of our culinary students are, and that's where, you know, where a lot of people are just to begin with, is they, they need to be some part of all three of those, but they need, they need to touch it, they need to feel it, it needs to hit them where they're at, you know, emotionally or physically, and psychologically, they, they need all those aspects. So I think that's really critical when we look at education, uh, particularly as we're trying to make a difference for our students' lives. And the way we're really trying to touch them is, is, is the learning that I have, the learning that we're trying to instill, is it reaching them at the level that's going to make them most successful? And I think, you know, the really good instructors out there, and there's a lot of them, they, they learn to incorporate all three of those facets and they kind of learn what each student needs individually. And that's really important. Well said, Dr. Miller. I love that. Let's talk about you. It all started at Slippery Rock, right? That's correct. Health, health education, first and foremost. I, I, a little birdie told me that uh, you might have been just like a second away from being on the U.S. Olympic team, polo, oh, that is, water that polo. That is correct. That is correct. The 1980 uh, Olympic water polo team tryouts in Lake Placid, New York. And for those who are a little <laughs> older, might remember Lake Placid. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I swam. I was all state in high school and swimming, and I continued swimming in college as well. Uh, but water polo became my, my really my first love. And uh, I had a great, great coach. And uh, my coach for water polo was one of those ones who I tried to take a lot of those things with me into the classroom and a teaching because he could reach anybody and everybody differently in any given time and just had that down to earth style, uh, even though he was a brilliant, brilliant man, uh, a great teacher, by the way, he was a great instructor. 
uh, but an awesome coach. And actually my water polo coach ended up in the water polo hall of fame. And for people that don't know, there is one, there is one. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, before we dive into, you know, the, 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 the journey, uh, for culinary school, I'd, I'd love you to kind of walk us through your, your personal journey, um, around becoming more and more educated, um, and specialized and, and how that all connects to the amazing hospitality that, that only, <laughs> only Dr. Miller was able to pull off. This is for those who can't see it. This, uh, this is many moons ago, 2007, um, back in those days, I used to tra travel around quite a bit and oftentimes had the great honor of, of speaking at graduation, but only Dr. Miller got my name up in lights. <laughs> All right. That was, a, that was a very special day. 2007, I think, what, you were only about 30 at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah just <laughs> God bless it. There's a reason I love you. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about you. Where You know, when when did education really 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 start to set in and you knew this is this is what i was was born to do well i you know right out of college i was offered a teaching job at gateway high school in monroeville pennsylvania and uh i jumped at the chance my uh, water polo coach at the time wanted me to go back to school and you know, get a master's and get, have a grad assistantship and uh, i was actually at that time tired of going to school it was four years and you know swimming and and water polo took a lot of time, a lot of effort, practices twice a day, every day. And so I decided I just wanted to take that teaching job. But unfortunately, back at that time, schools were starting to close. Um, people were not having as many children and they were closing many of the junior highs and elementary schools, emerging schools. And you know, my job was taken you know, two and a half years into my teaching career. I had to make a decision, was I going to bounce around all over schools or even states and uh, or get out of teaching. And my assistant principal at the time told me, he said, Pierce, you know, you really should think about getting out of teaching. And so I looked at some opportunities and eventually fell into working for Ponderosa Steakhouses and eventually worked my way up to becoming a general manager. And you know, I got I got a little tired of that too because you see the same positions. At some point, you get to that highest level, and you can't progress anymore. And I had some some friends that used to come into the restaurant, and they were looking at opening a bar restaurant. And I said, "Oh, that sounds like a great idea." I bought into that, owned a bar restaurant for about five years, and then uh, that's a very very tough business to own your own business, particularly in food service. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of my other partners who were more of the financial backing decided they didn't want to continue. And so I had to look for another opportunity. And Pennsylvania Culinary Institute at that time provided an opportunity. I started in as an instructor. And that was back in 1997. And around 2000, 2001, I believe career education came along and, and uh, bought Pennsylvania Culinary as part of a uh, conglomerate of schools. And I started working my way up through positions as Dean of Academics, Dean of Retention, Vice President of Academics, and eventually President of the school. And during that time, uh, I really had the inclination to say, you know, if I'm going to progress in this career, I need more education. My bachelor's degree is only going to get me so far. And, you know, the accrediting bodies who accredit our programs, they want people with advanced degrees. So, at that time, career education had, you know, uh, they would pay for you to go back to school. And I took an opportunity and I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania and got my master's of education. And I loved my journey back then. And unfortunately, I waited till I was about 40 years old before I went back. And if I would tell students out there or even other professionals listening to this podcast is don't wait. Take the opportunity, go back to school as soon as you can. Online now provides an opportunity. And uh, that was part of my dissertation. I will we'll, we'll probably touch that a little bit later. So uh, we'll bring that up again. And my professors were so good, I decided I wanted to continue on and get a doctorate. And I started the doctorate. And at that time, my position changed with career education. Pennsylvania Culinary, uh, unfortunately, would close. And I went to work for the corporation. That's where I met you. <laughs> and worked for uh, 
for education at Cordon Bleu Schools and traveled across the United States. And unfortunately, I had gone all the way through the, my program, was ready to start my dissertation. And traveling was just really, really difficult to complete a dissertation. I just couldn't do it. So my time lapsed. And in the meantime, so after, you know, further down the road, um, for education decided to close Le Cordon Bleu schools, as you well know. And I thought, well, boy, this is a great time for me to take advantage of the severance package. I'm going to go back to school and finish my dream. My uncle was a, a college professor, and I'd always really looked up to him. Um, it was the only uncle I have, by the way. My, my dad was an only child, and my mom had one brother, my uncle. And so... Uh, he and I sat down and we talked about it, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to school and finish. And so I got an opportunity at Point Park University, and this past April in 2022, April 12th to be exact, <laughs> I defended my dissertation through a Zoom video chat, by the way. I love on it. My, on my doctorate in educational administration and leadership. I love it. I love And I love the passion in your voice, too. Can you, can you back up a little bit, too, so you... You started teaching at high school. You walked away from that, got into the restaurant business, and then you came back to 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 teaching. Um, was there some serendipity in all of that? You know, you you kind of went around the block instead of going across the street, and then you ended up kind of where you belong. Two skill sets, good teacher, understood the industry right from the hospitality side, and it pulled right. you right into you know Topeka at the time. You know. Well, that leads, you know, that that led into uh, that wonderful picture you were shown earlier. Sir. So, <laughs> you know, the the picture in lights, of Chef Bachman is one of the things we prided ourselves in Pittsburgh. By the way, was we were going to be an outstanding customer service institution that carried into the classroom as well as with anybody that came to visit us. Um, I'm not unlike yourself, any dignitaries or even just local people who wanted to come in and and uh, see the school, take part in it. You know, eventually we opened a restaurant in the school and that, that was another pretty big deal. So that wow. hospitality extended. And one of the things that we tried to do as a group, we sat down in our management meetings and said, you know, how can we really make this special? And I have to be honest, I'm not sure we ever talked to Kirk Bachman and Lights. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. But but um let let's let's parlay from that. It wasn't just hospitality to your customers, to your students, but what I recall that the culture that you established in that organization around taking care and supporting your staff was also unrivaled. This idea of professional development at the, in those days, you know, through the American Culinary Federation to an instructor who was eligible, I believe that that campus had almost 100% participation, not just in membership with the American Culinary Federation, but certification. And, 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 and I mean, it was outstanding, you know, from, from the chef Bill Hunts to Art and Singa and, and, and they didn't pay me to say their names on the podcast, by the way, but but they're all they they were part of that, right? They were part of that culture. Um, how important is, in your mind, professional development for the team that you're building? Oh, I think it's the one of the most important things you can do, Kirk. Um, and you touched on all of it. You know, it started with Bill Hunt and Art and Zinga and you know Rick Panzera and all the chefs oh, yeah. were so <laughs> adamant in participation in the ACF. Uh, we did have across the United States, we had the highest participation in the ACF than any other city or any other chapter. You know, it was done by chapter, so it was the Pittsburgh chapter. Um, in any organization, you know, that carried over into the school because then we had the hot food team and the knowledge bowl team, uh, very active in the ACF with ACF accreditation and making sure that we were following all the, the policies and requirements that they wanted from a curriculum standpoint. And making sure that, uh, you know, the first and foremost attitude from our school was going to be one of hospitality. And yeah. so professional yeah. development comes out of that is, well, you can't do just hospitality for the students or the people who come in. You have to do it for your staff as well. And so we provided those same things. We had some outstanding uh, in-service days for the faculty, 
special development opportunities. <laughs> we took trips. Uh, at one point, we actually had sabbaticals for the chefs and sent some of the chefs overseas, and they would come back to in service and give us a you know give a presentation. Brought in uh, all kinds of individuals. Chef Byron Barty came in, as you well know, oh, yeah. certified master chef. He was the executive chef for Heinz Corporation. Yeah. And actually took Bill Hunt over to China, which is uh, another time, another story for another time. <laughs> uh, you know, and that just further right into, you know, you had Jeff Leonard on uh, earlier. And his whole focus is hospitality. What are we doing for the guests? What are we doing for our customer? And those things just all go hand in hand. You can't fake that. Oh, you really need to provide the nuts and the bolts and the nitty gritty. It's got to be part of the atmosphere. And the only really way to make that part of the atmosphere is you have to involve everybody and you have to make it important to them too. It so, has to be genuine and sincere. Right. Yeah, 100%. percent right. let, let, Let's talk a little bit about teaching and learning strategies. So, um, you know, this whole idea of how people learn pedagogy. What, what, Pierce, what's your perspective after all these years around developing, I'm going to say an appropriate curriculum, particularly as it relates to pedagogy, particularly as it relates to how people learn. You, you started to touch on it earlier that everyone learns differently and we have to, we have to, we have to be respectful of that and we have to acknowledge that, but I'd love your, you know, let, let's dive into your dissertation a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, way to go, Kurt. Um, <laughs> I think I think there's, you know, it's really simpler than everybody probably thinks that it is, or maybe spend some time really looking at. Um, there's a few simple mantras that go with that. First, to be flexible uh, as an instructor, as and with the curriculum. I think the curriculum needs to be student centered. It's not important what I know. Uh, you know, what do the students need to know for 10 years down the road? What do they need to know five years down the road? And that's so critical because our rapidly changing times, you know, I read a study just a little while ago that information currently in the world, as we know, exists is doubling every couple of years now. It used to be 10 years or 50 years. The information is so easily readable, you know, from social media to the news to just everything is changing so fast. So your curriculum has to be able to uh, matriculate along with what's changing in the time, you know, just like um, sustainable foods and, you know, just how restaurants are operating now. It's all changing and it's going to change here again in, you know, the very near future. What's important? What's, what's the hot ticket item? What's going on now? So I can tell a student, this is absolutely critically important. If you know this, you know what? In six months from now, it's something. It's going to change. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we've learned that, you know, other things are, you know, are changing. I actually wrote down a few notes. So I was really give, trying to give this some thought for you and, you know, how I want to approach this. You know, from a pedagogy standpoint, you know, I'll just go back to it. Some instructors will go in and they'll pull out information and I'm going to teach this information regardless uh, whether the students are getting it or not getting it. Or, you know, for example, you know very well, as well as you know Ed and any of the other chefs out there. Some chef, some students, some individuals are going to become a chef, you know, in a restaurant. They may work for a chain. Some may work for Disney. Some may decide that they want to be a corporate executive chef. Sure. Some may, work, like Ed has it, uh, high high fluting country clubs or you know other opportunities or. You know, there's just a zillion opportunities out there. So I need to be able to, we need to be able to, as teachers, as curriculum writers, be able to put together programs that are flexible enough that the students start to say, oh, yeah, I would really like to do that. Or maybe I want to do this. And then the faculty and the teachers, instructors also need to be flexible enough to say, okay, yeah, this is a great idea. Well, you can look over here. Or how about go talk to so-and-so or bring in guest speakers from outside that can talk to that. You know, we brought Byron Brady and corporate executive chef from, from Heinz. You know, that's a pretty prestigious position. How do you get there? What's important? You know, do you have to be a master chef? That's a pretty highfalutin, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, place to really try to achieve. And there aren't that many, as you, as you well know. 
And so I think the critical aspect of, from a pedagogical standpoint is, am I reaching the students where they want to be reached? And uh, there's a lot of great information out there. There's a lot of people who know an awful lot of things about how to cook or how to present food, pastry and baking, the, you know, that whole genre. And the critical aspect is not what I know or not what the instructors know, but can I get that to the students? Are they really getting that information? And is it really helping them to be successful? Well said, well said. Well said. You know, along those lines, just taking it, you know, a step further, um, obviously you've mentioned retention a couple of times, big part of the puzzle, right? Student retention, persistence is another way uh, to say it. Always at the center of an institution's uh, academic strategy, we'll say. Can you share, Pierce, um, from you, from your mind, some general philosophies, not only around the importance of helping students progress, but also helping students feel like they're succeeding in, in their minds, right? Not, not just according to our standards, but according to, like you say, you know, where we're meeting them. How do, how, how do we make them feel like I'm achieving my North Star? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question, Kirk, because ultimately that's, that's the final goal in education. You know, are we really making that difference? Yeah. You know, how do I make that difference to Kirk Bachman? versus that difference to Ed Leonard. Two very different people with different experiences, different backgrounds, different needs, uh, different socioeconomic status differences. Um, you know, just there's a whole genre of things we can talk about and the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place. So we're seeing more and more students come in from various countries and, you know, they want an education and English may not be their first language. It may be their second language, you know, or third language. So. Uh, I think the critical aspect from a retention standpoint is understanding the needs of our students. And a lot of times a learning standpoint is outside more of just the X's and O's, so to speak, in a classroom with somebody coming in and sitting down, uh, you know, writing out a chapter, doing the reading, putting together, taking a test, you know, getting a grade. You know, I learned a couple things, interestingly enough, in my educational journey, uh, particularly in my doctoral programs for my professors. My first set of professors at, at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, they did a very interesting thing. That nobody was going to fail who attempted, but you were going to have to do A work. Now, A work for Pierce Miller might be, I have to rewrite the paper three or four times. And I wrote the paper three or four times. And for Clark Bachman, it might only be writing the paper one time and you you have an A. That's generous. <laughs> the real learning occurs, the real learning occurs in what we don't know, not what we know. So I think putting together a retention standpoint is, is actually impacted greatly by the curriculum and how you instruct it, how you put that together. Understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the students, you know, if we're not satisfying the physiological needs, if students are coming into the classroom hungry or tired, they're not going to learn as well or do as well as if we have some of those other needs met and satisfied and getting them up that level, moving them up the ladder uh, into that knowledge standpoint is understanding that there's more impacts on helping a student be successful than just taking out some information and saying, oh, yeah, uh, your danger temperature zone is over 140 or 141, whatever it is now, because it kept changing. Um, so it's still changing. <laughs> it's still changing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's always going to change. It'll be something sure, new sure. next week. Uh, but I think that's that's critical is that we understand exactly how we're impacting a student. Some students are coming in after working two jobs at night, or they're going home and taking care of their kids. And other students yeah, don't have yeah. any of those issues or maybe no financial worries. And those all impact the students and retention and understanding that aspect of Every, everything you're mentioning, and, and I love hearing it, it's giving me chills, this idea of creating a culture of being student-centric, right? Um, yes. Because you're absolutely right. We, everyone comes to us with 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 a different situation, right? I, I see it on ground. I see it online. You know, I was going to – I I just want to back up a little bit. You've had the great luxury of 
of being on a long educational journey. So you had that that experience in a very traditional environment where you went to the classroom and engaged with your professors and 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 with your students. And you finished up, ironically enough, with your with your doctorate um primarily remotely, right? Through Zoom sessions and such. Some of that was because of the situation our 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 world was in. Um any thoughts on on where you think education is going in the future? I, I'm reading reports all the time about how much more comfortable people are in in a remote learning environment for, for some of the reasons you've mentioned, right? They may be taking care of loved ones. They may be working a couple of jobs to make ends meet. They may not have the ability to relocate, which was a norm. You know, if you wanted to go to Slippery Rock, you were going to live in the dorms at Slippery Rock back in the day. There was no other option. Where, where do you, and I won't hold you to it, but, you know, where, where are we five years from now, 10 years from now? Is is the whole thing shifting a little bit? That's, that's interesting you ask because uh, I'll bring up my dissertation. Uh, <laughs> it's 244 pages long, believe it or not. And... <laughs> My title was an exploration of assistant principal's perception of leadership preparation and professional development in Pennsylvania, because every state has their own requirements. And sure. so I, you know, I had to focus on a particular area, obviously being in Pittsburgh and interviewing assistant principals from Pittsburgh was critical. There's an interesting side note to this. I had 15 participants. Most were in their, uh, in their 40s as an assistant principal, some a little younger, some a little older. Uh, I did have a couple much younger assistant principals. One in particular, I believe was 27 years old. And one of the questions I asked is I wanted to find out about online learning versus on-ground learning versus hybrid learning. And to a person, they all said on-ground. They wanted to be in the classroom in front of it. It was better for them. However, most of them ended up in an online or a hybrid program. And so interestingly enough, the 27 year old was the one that was most comfortable with online learning and found uh, at least one aspect that I was not expecting. And it was uh, interesting to my, my department chair, my dissertation chair and my committee members that one of the comments he made was, being online and being asked a question, he said, in the classroom, he said, you have to come up with a response right away. And a lot of times they aren't well thought out or you gauge it to who's sitting in front of you. He said, whereas online, he had a lot of time to think about how his, what his responses were. And he thought, therefore, online learning was much more impactful to him. I think just from what I've seen and what I'm reading is I think we'll see more of a hybrid type program It'll be predominantly online, but getting together every once in a while, you know, whether it's uh, in a classroom setting or in some type of other setting, uh, to get together with your group, you put names and faces together or have some type of particular learning that you just can't do uh, sitting at home. And I think uh, you'll start to see some of that. Now, the issue goes with that is, is well, does my program prepare somebody for outside of Pennsylvania if they're in, let's say, uh, they're out in Colorado, so to speak, you know, how are they going to get back to Pittsburgh or wherever else the training is? And so I think that's one of the things you'll see that will be a little bit more uh, involved as far as learning gets. So online is here to stay. It's going to continue to involve. Uh, again, for all the things you just mentioned, Kirk, it's just too practical for people. And that's the rationale that came up. Even though my assistant principals loved on-ground learning, almost to a person who had an online program said they had to do it because they had family obligations or the money. They didn't want to have to pay to park downtown Pittsburgh or drive you know, in there. Look at the price of gas now. So that's changing how things are going to be involved and just what you're doing. So online learning became very, very practical. They all didn't like it, but a lot of times they still got an awful lot out of it. They found it a little bit more personal to themselves 
So therefore that learning still became very important and also very impactful. Very, so, very okay. insightful. I, I appreciate that response. And, and I, and I'm sort of going to connect it to the job we're trying to do, obviously with, with Escoffier students across the country, this idea of meeting them where they are. Um, however, this idea of proof of concept, right? Externship is in person. So to your point, they may be taking an Escoffier course in Pennsylvania, but they want to work um, in Colorado or California or New York. Right. Um, they have the opportunity to do that through an externship and apply the skills that they've been studying for some time. So I'll keep you posted. Seems like we're seems like we're on the right path there. You well, know, with, go ahead, go ahead, buddy. I'll, say, I'll go. I'll go back to you know your your prior expert here and uh, a good friend. You know. <laughs> If I had an opportunity to get a lesson from Chef Leonard, who's in New York, and I'm in Pittsburgh, I might not be able to travel to New York, or he's not coming here because he's a busy guy. And boy, could I get an awful lot from an online cooking lesson from Chef Leonard? I absolutely could. Yeah. And it would be very impactful. Um, also, the benefit to that is he wouldn't see how many times I screwed up the dish, but <laughs> I, I think I think online is just because it's making the world smaller and yeah, our world yeah. is shrinking fast. Yeah. It's so interesting when Ed and I um, spoke, we spent most of the time talking about you and here you and I are talking, spending most of the time talking about Ed, which I know he loves. I know he loves, you know, j again, to sort of stay on this, this topic when, um, you know, this idea of the business of teaching when developing business models for academic institutions, which you have a lot of experience doing. Um, I, I don't really I, I'm always a half glass full sort of individual. So I don't want to ask you, Pierce, how do institutions get it wrong? I'd rather ask how do institutions get it right? Um, I think that's an excellent approach, Kirk. And particularly from the culinary aspect of it, because I, I did teach in high school and obviously have health and physical education as, you know, as a background, that was my, you know, initial background in teaching. And I would, you know, I would compare it to almost to teaching health, which uh, by the way, I didn't really enjoy too much. It was a little bit of a challenge and um, you have students all over the board, particularly in high school. Um, but I think, I think from a business model, how, how, we, how we get it right is we provide a lot of opportunities for students. We expose them to a lot of things. And that's constantly evolving. And again, I'll just go back to the online piece. Just what you're doing right here with a podcast. Yeah. How many schools are doing that? Well, not too many, Kirk. Not that I know of. And just providing an opportunity like this to be exposed to somebody and who knows where that will lead. Maybe somewhere down the road, somebody says, you know what, I really would like to go to New York and work for Chef Leonard. Wow, that would be an awesome experience. Or, you know, I don't want to go work for Chef Leonard because I, that's not what I want to do. I want to go do something else with your podcast. Again, you're bringing in other professionals and other experiences and other things for them to see. And so how the business, you know, the institutions are getting it right is we're really very student-centered, way more so than any of your Ivy League schools or universities that are putting out a lot of information. And, you know, it's about how much money they can spend for school. And it's a prestige thing and it's a name. Um, whereas I think particularly in culinary education, we expose students to the things that they really need to be successful. And they can take this and make a career out of it. They can become an online, you know, they can do, look at all the stuff online with chefs now. Yeah. Online, yeah. the food channel expanded greatly in, you know, in a very, very short period of time. And it's not gone away, by the way, that's still out there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've spent, um, I was just noticing that we spent a great amount of our time talking about how to create an incredible experience, a student-centric experience for our students. Super, super critical. Uh, it could be applied to the hospitality industry. You always, you know, some advice that I got from a, from a friend a long time ago was, you know, the number one thing you can do in business is like your customers, 
like your customers and you're halfway there. So I want to kind of flip it a little bit, Pierce, and um, think about it from the student perspective. Are, are there some critical elements in a student's journey that are important characteristics, approaches, um, mindset that a student should have in order to position themselves to have the most successful experience that they can. You can you can speak to that as a student. Well, I think, you know, particularly as from my experiences and running a you know, the Culinary Institute and obviously from my own educational journey, the more you can expose yourself to, the more you can get your hands in, the more questions you can ask, the more things that you can do. Uh, it's not always on a test. I used to tell our students, and I, you know, I would try to reinforce this strongly with the instructors. You can't test everything that we teach in a classroom. It's impossible. And first off, why would you want to do that? I don't want to test everything they know. I just want to know that they have the basics and they understand the concepts and then how do they make it better? You know, one of the things that we always talk about in education, and I think sometimes where educators get it wrong, so to speak, is they think we teach critical thinking and you don't teach critical thinking. What you do teach is how to help students become critical thinkers. How do we enable to be a critical thinker? So, you know, if I expose the student to a particular situation, how do they apply it or synthesize it to another given situation that might be completely different, but they have to know the same information, you know? And this was uh, an example I brought up to you uh, earlier when we were talking, you know, when I was, uh, you know, going to the schools and I would, run into Chef Polly Malott from Disney. And one of the things he wanted our students to know is if they're making a chocolate chip cookie recipe, can they make it with a chewy center? Can they make it so it's crispy? And they have to understand that. They have to be able to apply that knowledge. So I can test them all day on the recipe for a chocolate chip cookie, but can they apply it to the situation they need? And I think that's really, really important that we help the students become uh, more exposed, more worldly knowledge than what we're actually just putting on a test. And that's what's critical for students. Students have to realize that a lot of information and the opportunities, even with these podcasts, you're not quizzing somebody or testing somebody on a podcast, but this information that you're sending out from this group here, not necessarily for me, but from Ed and some of the other experts that you've had on that I've watched, you know, that might get a student to think, oh, wow, I would really like to do that, or I want to get more involved with that. So how can they do that on their own? What can they do? Where can they go? And we need to do that as a group. We need to make sure that students understand that there's more out there than what we're just putting between four walls or an online, you know, environment. I love, I love that example. Um, I'm going to use sort of a, a a similar example of of how we have progressed over the years. I can remember not so long ago, call it a couple of decades ago, when we sat in classrooms and students worked real hard to put their 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 presentation plates together and they would bring it to the chef. And that chef would pretty much dictate if there was enough salt, if the the product was cooked properly, and so on and so forth. And what I've seen, particularly at Escoffier, both online and on ground, is this idea, I love your quote, you teach students how to be critical thinkers. So what I see in the classroom today, Pierce, is the student bringing the plate or the chef going to the student and asking the student about the dish. Right. Take, taste it and tell me what you're experiencing. What does it need? What does it lack? You know, you'll be able to then articulate to Chef Pauly that you understand what he's looking for in that cookie, soft center, crispy outside. However, yeah. without the foundation, without the basics, without the ability to cognitively articulate what you're doing, it won't happen, right? So I've seen a big shift. Um, and of course, our chef instructors of 
become slimmer, right? Because <laughs> they're not tasting as much food, but the students are tasting their food and they're having incredibly important conversations with their instructors about what's going on in that plate. I'm getting chills because that's what it's all about, Pierce. That's that's what education is all about. That's all that our friends at, you know, Cordon Blue back in the day also tried to, you know, Patrick Martin would come in and, you, you know, he didn't necessarily want to taste the food, but he wanted to know if if we were tasting the food and what we were experiencing through that food. So now really, really great conversation. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, hey, I'm going to be, go, go ahead, buddy. Go ahead. I think it's really important. And you just brought it up. The students often know what was wrong with their dish before they even present it. Before they even bring it to you. They know what's wrong. Sometimes they're apologetic, right? Yes, they <laughs> you know. know. Never, never apologize, but yeah, but but understand. And and right. that's what we said at the beginning of the podcast, that educators, chefs, teachers, they are really nothing more than faci facilitators of knowledge. That's just, correct. Just, just create the conversation in those four walls and and then education remains a beautiful thing if that doesn't change we've done our job and i'll see you on the golf course right <laughs> well you know, I'll, 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 bring, I'll bring my buddy back up again i watched ed do this many many times you know when a student brought a dish up the question was is what could you have done better and the student would tell them yeah you know, and so he knew the learning had taken place and there's no reason to go through and say, you know, this is a D dish or this is an F or a C minus, you know, dish because the learning occurs from making mistakes, not necessarily doing things right, but understanding why. And then again, that's teaching how to critically think if they can already analyze and know what they did wrong and fix it. You know, Kirk, the only problem is I can't do that on the golf course. I just wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> nor can I, nor can I, Hey, <laughs> Hey, I would be remiss if I didn't, um, you've got the hat on. I, I, I have to share with everyone. You, you know, I grew up in Chicago, born in, born and raised, and then moved out to Colorado for whatever reason. I could remember running around the neighborhood with my buddy, Johnny Ryan, who was obsessed with the Pittsburgh pens. And from that day, when I was in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I have loved the Pittsburgh Penguins. No, I mean, it wasn't just a coincidence when I met you. And, and the Blackhawks are amazing, right? What a great franchise. But I was a Pittsburgh Penguin fan. And when when my Joseph, my son, Joseph Henry, was born, who's now 12, just turned 12, first gift that arrived came from Dr. Miller, and that was a Pittsburgh Pens rocking chair. And I'll never forget that. And so he too loves the pens to this day. And it's, and it's not like you're being subtle, right? You've got the championships right there, five of them. You know, Mario Lemieux was part of the first two. And then of course, Sydney, the, the other three, and you've got the hat. Are you, are you still as passionate about the pens as always? Yeah. I, you know, I think I mentioned to you, this is the first year I'm, I'm finally going to give up my season tickets. I've had them for, 20 straight years and actually before that from a number of years all the way back to 1981 was my first year um, but I had him straight from 2000 <laughs> on here to just recently but you know uh, Sid the kid who's no longer a kid just had his 35th birthday on 8-7-1987 he just turned 35 this year how did that happen huh wow wow a lot of people don't know that's where his number came from is 8-7 1987 was his birthday when he was born. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, um, if you're in Pittsburgh, you, you have to be a sports junkie. It's the Steelers, you know, the Penguins <laughs> and the Pirates are falling greatly behind just because of, but the, still a classic franchise, classic right? franchise. Yeah. Are, are we allowed to share screens here, Kirk? Do you, do you do this? I think you could try it. Yeah. Give it, give it a well, shot. Well, I, I'll see if I can share my screen. I'm not sure it's going to let me do it. Yeah, well, okay. So can you see this? There it is. There it is. It's exactly it what is. we talked about. So point out the rivers. Point out the rivers All there. Right, so this is the Monongahela that comes down. Monongahela, okay. The Allegheny comes down from up north, and it flows into the Ohio. The Ohio. And then so the stadiums. Here, yeah, yeah. Over here is Heinz Field. And then you can't see <laughs> 
PNC Park on the other side of that. This is the, uh, you can barely see it's a convention center in Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. And is that's the bridge, right? The yellow bridge that you would, yeah. Now, walk when over. you come in from the airport, this is the one right here. Yeah, yeah. You come across this one, and this is looking from up on Mount Washington. It's considered one of the 10 best views in the United States. And so, uh, what a what a beautiful fun. city. No one's ever done that on the podcast. Of course, Dr. Miller pulls up a, a sheer screen. I absolutely love it. What a beautiful city. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if uh, I I had a few others. Um, let me see if I had I had something else. Uh, um, I didn't want to share. You can you can see the this was the dissertation. <laughs> copy the copy the picture i actually just got my signed copy from my chair dr hippert and dr gutkin and dr alexa oh congratulations uh, my dr. friend dr mcintyre who's the dean of the program that's that's precious that's really really special i'm so proud of you that's great uh, so that's anyway excellent. um i will uh i will stop share there because you know that's that's the important stuff that's beautiful that's beautiful Hey, I'm not going to let you get out of here before the name of the podcast is the ultimate dish. You're in Pittsburgh. So I hope you stay home in your mind. What is the ultimate dish? <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to go Pittsburgh ease, right? So <laughs> I was really seriously thinking about this, you know, what would, what would my ultimate dish be? And, you know, you're in Pittsburgh, you're, you're a meat and potatoes guy. Of course. <laughs> Having a little uh, Germanic heritage there, Chef Bachman, you you obviously know a little bit about that. So the ultimate dish for me is going to be family and friends sitting around a grill, grilling steaks. We have a little seafood. You got to throw in some lobster shrimp, maybe some crab legs. <laughs> Good cold beer. Now, it could be Coors or the local Iron City beer. <laughs> but it's probably going to be a microbrew of some type and obviously great conversation. That would be my ultimate dish. And that's the perfect, perfect dish. I'm not surprised at all. We need to send this to the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce. I think uh, they'd be <laughs> they'd be pretty happy. But uh, hey, buddy, thank you so much for taking some time. As expected, you delivered unbelievably insightful, very educational, very passionate, respectful. I love you, man. Keep staying healthy, keep golfing, and we'll do it again, okay? Love you too, B-Man. Sometime we'll have to do it again, you know? We will. Next time it's you, Ed, and myself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need more than 45 minutes for that one. <laughs> All right, you know, my that, friends. That might, be, that might be the ultimate podcaster. That might. That might. It, All right, know. buddy. You take care, and... Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.